Hey guys, Tettles here. Today, I'm here to discuss the Battle for Azeroth pre-patch and help create a guide to give all of you guys information as to what uh, Moonkin will kind of look like playstyle, legendary, trinket, uh, and talent-wise. Um, this guide's purpose is to kind of go hand-in-hand -hand with the Dreamgrove GG text document. So if uh, anything changes in the pre-patch, it'll definitely be noted in the description and uh, it'll be further explained inside of the text guide itself. So with that caveat, hope you all enjoy, and let's get into the guide. So the first thing we have to talk about is what is changing. Balance had a few impactful changes to its base kit. The new Eclipse system and the Changing Room Mastery were the two most important ones. This created the Spenders of Star Surge and Starfall to see a decrease in power overall, while the Builders of Lunar Strike and Solar Wrath with their associated empowerments saw increases in power by comparison. As for added abilities, Tiger Dash will be the new form of long distance travel in both instanced and uninstanced content. While it is slightly weaker than the now removed Displacer Beast and the global cooldown attached to Wild Charge, there is no really other great option um, to compete for a spot for long distance travel. Twin Moons and Eclipse are the most rotationally impactful changes as of the added abilities. Twin Moons has been a staple of our multi target in Legion in the form of Lady in the Child for a while. So this returning as a talent is always a welcome change. The addition of Eclipse allows our single target rotation to have a little bit more complexity and changes the rotation, brings a bit of good RNG into the kit. Soothe and Hibernate are both great utility pieces, and the more utility Moonkin has, it's really the better for the players. So the abilities getting removed are largely shifting power away from certain spells. Uh, the removing of Stellar Empowerment takes power away from Starfall in favor of base damage from Sunfire and Moonfire, which is very good. The loss of Displacer Beast negatively affects our ability to cheese movement during certain encounters. So the overall theme, really, of these changes seems to be to even out the power stuff in a certain abilities, like a few abilities, and kind of spread it out to the rest of the toolkit overall. The removal of these abilities isn't really an issue because of how powerful they were for much of Legion, and this really tries to help create a healthier class overall. So as for reworked abilities, um, these are the abilities that have seen major gameplay changes moving from Legion into Battle for Azeroth. So we'll start with Nature's Balance. Nature's Balance is now a tier 15 talent and has been reworked to give two astral power per three seconds and the astral power levels out to 50 instead of zero out of combat as well. This essentially is Be Blessing of Anshe from Blessing of the Ancients with the out of combat astral power balancing effect. Uh, Star Lord, Star Lord is now a throwback to the balanced tier 24 piece buff. It has been changed to be a 75 tier talent and allows Star Surge and Starfall to grant you 3% haste for 20 seconds, stacking up to three times. Fury of Loon. Um, Fury of Loon calls down a beam of energy on the primary target, which will hit all additional targets within eight yards and generates 40 astral power over the duration of the Fury of Loon. So it no longer drains your astral power and is a builder instead. Uh, New Moon. New Moon is like a 3 charge spell on a 25 second recharge rate. It's very similar to how it functioned in Legion except it has a longer recharge rate. Uh, the first charge does a minor amount of damage and generates 10 astral power. Uh, the second one is a little bit more, a little bit longer, generates 20 astral power. And then the third one, Full Moon, generates 40 astral power and is a longer cast time. Uh, the talent is now currently on the tier 100 row as well. Uh, as for Stellar Flare, this now is a builder as opposed to a spender. It generates 8 astral power and has mastery scaling. Uh, the damage done by Stellar Flare has been decreased to deal slightly less than Moonfire and Sunfire damage over the duration of the dots themselves. Uh, as for Empowerments, they moved Old Star Lord into Empowerments, so now Empowerments have a 15% reduced cast time, and the Solar Empowerment has been changed a little bit to where it cleaves multi-target to all targets within 8 yards of the primary target. As always for legendaries, you really should sim yourself to find your personalized top choice. These are recommendations to what we have seen from sims from normalized mythic raid gear. So with that really out of the way, we recommend uh, Safuza Secret and Lady in the Chat as the top combinations for really all situations. Safuza Secret doesn't even need to get the proc of the haste buff to be the best option too, so this is very, very powerful. This combination is highly competitive on single target with the legitimate ease of use. If there's ever any additional targets, the combination just gets incredibly stronger because you're wearing this Lady and the Child uh, Legendary. Promises of a Loon 
and Impeccable Felescence are good alternatives for single target if you don't have the option of where Lady in the Child or Sifu's Secret. Promises is uh, very powerful if you can stand still for long periods of time and do not have to move for mechanics. Impeccable Felescence is really strong when paired with Inclination, Chosen of Alone, and you have a favorable kill time for yourself. As for multi-target options, the only option really other than Sifu's Secret and Lady in the Child that is really competitive is Kill Jaden's Burning Wish. This trinket is very powerful, especially if there is mass multi-target. However, if you can proc your Sifu's ever, then Kill Jaden's will have an incredibly hard time performing. Additionally, if there is any if there is ever any bout of single target, then Sifu's is better than Kill Jaden's. However, Kill Jaden's can outperform your Sifu's and Lady in the Child if you do have less than optimal uh, trinket choices. So you should always be like kind of looking to sim yourself, but Sifu's Secret and Lady in the Child will generally be your top performers on single target and multi-target. I'm going to go through and explain all the talents, when to use them, and, the when, and when they should be taken. Talents are the most likely subjects to change, so I would recommend checking in the description to make sure that none of the rows have changed before I follow this advice. Uh, so with that said, let's jump into the tier 15 row. Um, this row is of Nature's Balance, Warrior Balloon, and Force of Nature. So Nature's Balance is great for sustained multi-target scenarios as the constant generation of astral power is very powerful. This will be particularly good in Mythic Plus as you have the opportunity to generate 50 astral power after combat pretty quickly. This would be most useful in open world content in dungeons such as Upper Care with large downtime between trash and boss pulls. Um, so keep that in mind whenever you're trying to think about when to use this. Um, large amounts of downtime in between um, dungeon pulls is really good. Sustained AoE, um, five plus targets, it's really good on sustained AoE. And uh, open world content, the, the instant 50 astral power is pretty strong. Um, for Warrior Balloon, this talent is ideal for hybrid encounters as well as being useful for priority target swaps and burst cleave. Uh, the three free Lunar Strikes still make you want to use back to back and ideally with empowerments as possible. It's really important to keep it on cooldown. Fights like this, uh, fights that this talent would be useful on a Portal Keeper that where it has small adds that need to be bursted in periods of single target and multi target. Um, other options are just like really quick burst fights like Antor and High Command. Coven of Shavara, this will be pretty good on, stuff like that. Um, so the Force of Nature, or the trees, the trees are ideal for pure patchwork, single target, as this talent does not scale with number of targets that well, therefore you use them on cooldown on single target fights, unless there is like an increased damage taken window that the boss has on itself, similar to like Kangaroth, where you might um, hold them for a few seconds or whatever to make sure that you get the trees during this, um, this increased damage taken window. In Mythic Plus, if tanks are really having issues with threat as well as damage taken, um, these are really strong for that. Uh, World Quest leveling, it allows you to like pull bigger and get more mobs grouped up and then you drop the trees and then the trees taunt off you. So this is also really powerful for that as well. Uh, so I think that's generally how you use this row. Nature's Balance is consistent, multi-target. Uh, whenever you want the 50 Astral Power to start off, it's pretty good. Um, Warrior Balloons, Burst, uh, two to four targets. Um, hybrid fight scenarios, and then Force of Nature is obviously pure patchwork or utility uses. Uh, as for the tier 30 row, Tiger Dash, Renewal, and Wild Charge. Um, this is like a general mobility row with Renewal kind of slapped in there. So Tiger Dash is only really useful in fights on MNR or when like open world questing or leveling. It's really good for covering large distances fast. Um, there can be merit for taking in a Mythic Plus, but it's going to be on a per encounter basis whenever you really don't need that mobility to get from point A to point B that Wild Charge provides. Renewal, it's good on pure single target low movement fights, um, whenever movement really is an issue. Veramathras is like a really good example of when Renewal is pretty strong. You don't really have any unpredictable movement. The heal itself is very powerful. Wild Charge, so even with the half a second global cooldown associated with the spell, our Disengage is just going to be the best talent in almost all situations. It's going to be the default, really. Uh, just be sure to get used to not being able to instantly dodge mechanics or you might find yourself dying more often. So kind of like hesitate a little bit if you know a mechanic is coming out and that you need to use Wild Charge reactively. So yeah, just be really mindful about that. Um, so this row, yep, just Tiger Dash, really good for open world questing, good for covering large distances, renewal, really strong self-heal, and Wild Charge, very powerful disengage. Tier 4 v 5 is the Affinity tier. This encompasses Feral Affinity, Restoration fin Affinity, and Guardian Affinity. So we'll start with Feral Affinity. Feral Affinity gives you 15% passive movement speed, and it gives you access to some Feral-specific abilities, 
but as a moonkin and a damage deal, you don't really have any use for these feral specific abilities. There's no need to like rip or rake a target. So restoration affinity, um, restoration affinity heals you for three percent of your maximum health every five seconds, and whenever you're at full health, it'll heal an additional party member for three percent of your maximum health. It also gives you access to some notable restoration spells such as wild growth swiftman and rejuvenation but unfortunately it takes you out of moonkin form to be able to cast these abilities so it's a little bit lackluster and it costs you a fair amount of damage to be able to use those abilities uh, guardian affinity this will be your default pick generally speaking it gives you a passive six percent damage reduction and access to notable guardian abilities such as frenzy region and iron fur this is the best option generally speaking for this row because the six percent damage reduction because you also get some form of self-sustain through frenzy regeneration even though you're not in form the same as restoration affinity you still get the damage reduction while having similar healing potential so yeah overall feral affinity if you if you if damage intaken is not an issue and you just want the movement speed feral affinity is very powerful restoration affinity if it's consistent damage to the point where you don't really want to shift out of form or your group might need that extra healing or swift through swift mend every so often restoration affinity is quite strong guardian affinity obviously your default choice um, hop in a bear form and pop frenzy regeneration to heal for 25 percent of your health uh, very powerful overall so as for tier 60 this is the more utility focused row um, so the first talent on this row is mighty bash the mighty bash is a, a single target five second stun this target seems limited use in PvE content, but whenever you need a, a single target stun, it's very powerful overall. Um, so think Viceroy and see the Triumvirate dungeon, uh, the little tentacles. Mighty Bash is very, very good for that um, for that dungeon and stunning those tentacles. Mass Entanglement. Mass Entanglement is always strong in a few fights per tier, whenever you can choose mechanics with it. It will continue to be strong on fights like Covenant Agrimar. It's also really good to lazily instantly proc Safu's if you're if you're using Safu's and Lady and the Child as recommended um, prior. Mass Entangling is always going to be pretty decent on a few fights per tier, but not really your default choice normally. Uh, Typhoon, typically your default. The displacement and the knockback is very powerful in many situations. In addition, in additionally to that, it also will cancel casts very frequently. So as a class that has a 60 second interrupt, this is pretty good. Agrimar, Agrimar ad management or uh, world questing are really too staple uses of typhoon typhoon also knocks back 10 yards further than it's used to uh that's because i think it got bu it got buffed by five yards and then it's also been modified by the moonkin aura that gives you five additional yards so all in all mighty bash pretty strong but generally lackluster by comparison to the other two t talents on this row mass entanglement very niche usage but at the same time very powerful whenever it sees that niche usage because rooting targets in place can either be really feast or famine Typhoon, really uh, consistent, cancels casts, displaces, knocks back, all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, that's tier 60 really. So for tier 75, this is one of our more important rows for damage. All three of these talents of Soul of the Forest, Star Lord, and Incarnation Chosen in Maloon fill the same niche to some regard of having a single target aspect and a multi-target aspect to the talent. Um, so you're always just really going to pick which is like semming the highest for your specific situations. Um, so starting with Soul of the Forest, this town is ideal for sustained multi-target fights with four plus targets, which is very rare, or when an encounter needs sporadic heavy AoE damage, which is also pretty rare. Um, so you will rarely use this in its current iteration on single target or multi-target. Unfortunately, the 30% empowerment damage just isn't strong enough for this talent. Uh, Star-Lord, it's a rehashing of our tier 24 piece as previously stated. This is the best for pure single target patchwork fights. You want to play it similar to how we did in Tomb of Sargeras, which is whenever you get in close to the last 4 seconds of this 20 second buff, try to not spend Astral Power as to get the new buff right away whenever the previous one ends to maintain um, as high uptime as possible. Incarnation Chosen of Alun. This replaces Celestial Alignment as our primary damage cooldown. This will be used on 2-4 to four targets sustained and on any fights with any, any intermittent multi-targeting. So any hybrid fights, any like intermittent multi-targeting, this will be the premier choice. Um, so yeah, Soul of the Forest, sustained 4 targets plus, Star-Lord, uh, Patchwork single target, pretty good, Incarnation Chosen of Maloon, everything else really, you need a 30 seconds worth of burst every 3 minutes, that's pretty good, 2-4 uh, to four sustain, pretty good, Intermittent multi-targeting, pretty good, yeah, so that's uh, tier 75. Uh, so the tier 90 row of Stellar Drift, Twin Moons, and Stellar Flare is generally the multi-target row. This row suffers from some of the similar issues as the row prior, to where you'll typically just take the top simming talent, and they will all fill uh, the same niche to some regard. So for Stellar Drift, 
this this talent has seen pretty heavy nerfs. Uh, it's now down to 20% starfall damage, 20% starfall radius. It has to be paired with Lady and the Child Legendary, and is better with 3 plus sustained targets. So ENR high command, like long term sustained 3 plus targets, Solar Drift plus Lady and the Child is going to be your, your go to choice. Twin Moons, it acts like Lady and the Child in the damage stacks, but the, the additional dot does not. So you don't get 3 dots, you still only get 2. You use it on hybrid style fights with single and multi-target periods like Portal Keeper or any um, fight with sustained two targets, Dog, Coven. And of note, um, this talent is not really that far behind Stellar Flare, like a few like tenths of a percentage points. So if you don't want to waste the hassle of managing Stellar Flare, it's also currently a really good option on single target. So keep that in mind kind of whenever you're trying to decide what to use. Uh, this is also the premier Mythic Plus choice as well. And then as for Stellar Flare, this is your patchwork single target option. It's really weak whenever any like secondary target is added to the current state. Um, Stellar Flare is now a generator as opposed to a spender as talked in the change log. Um, and make sure you have to keep 100% uptime on this uh, talent to make sure you have full usage of it. Um, so now on to the tier 100 row. This, this row gives us the most choice on the style of encounters we are facing. Unfortunately, this row has been incorrectly balanced for a while and it is most likely uh, the greatest subject to change row out of all of them that we have. So check back in the description to make sure um, that there have been no changes to the tier 100 row specifically. Uh, shooting stars, with the most recent buff to shooting stars, this talent now exceeds in most damage profiles over all the other options for this row. The only time that you would choose another talent is if you need burst single target, burst multi-target from Fury of Alone. Um, and then that takes us into Fury of Alone. For, so Fury of Alone used to be an incredibly powerful choice for the tier 100 row, but now is overshadowed by Shooting Star's dominance, unfortunately. So now the only time you really ever take Fury of Alone or whenever you need um, burst single target damage or burst AoE damage. So burst single target is like whenever a target has an increased damage taken phase and burst AoE is like intermittent AoE where you can get the beam to deal way more damage than uh, Shooting Star's otherwise would. Um, and then that brings us on to New Moons. Moons have seen slight nerfs by comparison to the Legion variant in the form of increased cooldown and less damage. Currently, they are significantly behind and unfortunately will not see much play in their current state. However, if you do enjoy the class fantasy, feel free to play Moons on single target. It's really not that far behind, but it is a, it is a worse choice than Fury of Alone and Shooting Stars. And with that, now we conclude the talent section. Make sure you really check in the description to make sure that there have been no changes since this is posted. And since this is pre-patched, there is a decent chance that some things will change at some point, so make sure that you are checking in with that. So as for how you should gear, um, in general you should never really listen to a guide as to how to gear it. You should probably sim yourself, um, but these are just going to be some sweeping statements from what we've seen from sims in regards to the gearing uh, process for Moonkin moving into BFA and moving into the pre-patch. Um, so now with that said, intellect is now much more important stat in the pre-patch and moving into BFA because of how much they've uh, nerfed secondaries and buffed um, intellect as a whole. Um, it will be uh, your top stat, one of your top stats almost unanimously, a rough approximation of the secondary stat priority after intellect being your top primary stat will be um, haste, um, and then crit is equal to versatility. Um, they're both pretty close, and then mastery is pretty far down there. Mastery is um, not that great anymore after the nerfs to the mastery coefficient. So now for some trinkets. Um, some, so some notable trinkets that we've seen for single target um, are Norganon's Prowess, Prototype Personal Decimator, uh, Tarnished Sentinel Medallion, Terror from Below, and Acrid Catalyst Injector. All five of these trinkets have been um, performing pretty well. Uh, typically it's going to be based on um, what your independent eye level of these trinkets are, what you have in your bags and everything. So you really should be simming for accuracy, but generally speaking, Norganon's Prowess and Prototype um, will be the top couple, especially whenever you have to factor in eye level um, that people will generally have. And then as for multi-target, um, same as above, you should really sim yourself to try to get the most accurate feedback, but Prototype Personal Decimator, Terminus Signaling Beacon, and Organus Prowess were pretty unanimously the top three trinkets. You really should sim yourself, but those this trinket list should give you a general understanding of about where you should be. If you have some like crazy Titan Forges or anything, you really should start sending yourself to kind of look at where you should be though. So now I'm going to talk you through your optimal opener and what are the optimal rotations are. We're going to slow it down a little bit for the opener and show you button by button what is happening. I'm using the talents of Force of Nature, Star Lord, Stellar Flare, and Fury of Loon as the damage talents. Um, so let's just kind of get into it. I'm going to start off by pre-casting two solar rats at negative two and a half seconds on the pull timer as to not pre-pull the boss. After that, 
I'll apply the dots of Sunfire, Moonfire, and Stellar Flare to the dummy. And then after that, you will begin casting Solar Wrath into the mob until you get to 40 Astral Power, and at which point you will pop your cooldowns of Celestial Alignment, Fury of a Loon, and Force of Nature. After that, you'll begin building and spending Astral Power within the cooldown window, making sure you don't cap on Empowerments, and this will be covered a little bit further in the single target part of the rotation guide. Uh, so then for the single target rotation, it's really like a priority list. So starting at the top of that priority list, capping Astral Power is one of the most important things. Capping Astral Power will severely, severely hurt your damage. Don't exceed the 100 Astral Power cap. This is mitigated by using Star Surge when available. Just really make sure that you're not going to go over the 100 Astral Power cap. Uh, the next thing is maintain 100% uptime on your dots of Moonfire, Stunfire, and Stellar Flare. In addition to that, make sure you don't really overdot. Pay attention to the Pandemic Window. Um, pandemic Window is the mark in which your dots have 30% of the duration left remaining, and you're able to refresh the dot without a loss. This is 6.6 .6 seconds for Moonfire, 5.4 seconds for Sunfire, and 7.2 seconds for Stellar Flare. Uh, spend your Solar and Lunar Empowerments. From Legion to BFA, there is a huge increase in priority and empowerment spending. Make sure to not cast Solar Wrath when your Lunar Strike is at 3 stacks and vice versa. Do the Eclipse Mechanic for potential over-capping issues that you will see. Use your cooldowns effectively. Saving cooldowns for Reverse Windows is incredibly smart, but losing usage is not always a great choice, so be really mindful about when you're using uh, your cooldowns. Uh, and then lastly, fill with Solar Wrath. Whenever you have nothing else to do, really fill with Solar Wrath. Really try to always be casting. Uh, if there's multiple targets, you can hit fill with Lunar Strike instead, but other than that, just really try to fill with Solar Wrath and always be casting. So then as for the multi-target rotation, this is also a system of checks and everything that you need to go through every single time to make sure that you're doing the optimal amount of damage to all the targets. So the first thing is really maintaining 100% uptime on your dots. Take Twin Moons as well to help cut down on the global cooldowns required to maintain Moonfire on all the targets. You'll spend a lot of your time dotting uh, targets depending on how many packs and how many mobs there are. So Twin Moons is like a really good luxury for this kind of thing. Uh, spend your Astral Power on Starfall. You begin Starfalling on three targets. So if it's two targets, you'll still begin to cast Star Surge as your primary spender. But if it's not, then you'll begin uh, Starfalling on three targets. Uh, number three is spend Lunar Empowerments. If you have any Lunar Empowerments banked up and the mobs are within eight yards of one another, if two mobs are within eight one yards of one another, uh, this is way better than a Solar Wrath cast. So make sure you spend your Lunar Empowerments whenever these mobs are grouped up. In the same vein, also spend on Solar Empowerments whenever you get the Eclipse proc off your Lunar Strike filler. Make sure you spend on Solar Empowerments. Um, this is very important because additionally the Solar Empowerment does uh, splash damage within 8 yards to all the targets. And then finally, spend uh, fill with Lunar Strike. If your Lunar Strike can hit multiple targets, fill with Lunar Strike. If not, you should fill with Solar Wrath instead. Um, Lunar Strike has an 8 yard radius, so make sure you are watching that. So yeah, that is the conclusion of this guide. I hope everybody's enjoyed the guide and learned lots. Going forward, I'm really going to try to convert many of the Battle for Azeroth guides into YouTube content in order to help people who prefer that style of guide. Um, I'm going to add my Discord, Twitch, and the Moonkin Monthly Patreon into the description as a, along with the Moonkin Monthly guide that goes along with this video in order for you guys to be able to check me out, check out that guide, see what all has changed. Um, you can check me out elsewhere. I hope this helps, and then I hope everybody has a great rest of your day. Thank you, guys.